Welcome to Starter TV. I'm Tracy Fitzpatrick. Our guest today is Alexander Lejeau, Chief Knowledge Officer of the National Association of Corporate Directors in Washington, D.C. She's also a founder of Capital Expert Services, a global consulting group. In addition, she's an in-demand speaker and has published a plethora of business books and articles. Alexandra, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, Tracy. Tell us a little bit about your background and how it helped you achieve becoming the Chief Knowledge Officer at the National Association of Corporate Directors, but also an entrepreneur as well. Thank you. That's a really good question. And I think I would take a almost a botanical approach talking about crossbreeding since my paternal grandfather crossbred the tangerine and the grapefruit and came up with a tangelo and we're very proud of that oh, in my family. So I'm talking about breeding and mm -hmm. if you cross an entrepreneur with a librarian you get me. My dad was an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. He came to DC at age 23 in 1940 and started a research company and built it up with full of non-US engineers and other scientists to do research for the military. Meanwhile, my mother was a librarian, just plugging away at her master's degree in library science and then becoming a children's librarian. So I had this wild and crazy entrepreneur going all around the world recruiting talent and then someone who would just go to the local library every single day with her bag lunch. Eventually he crashed and burned as an entrepreneur because he sold his company for stock and the stock became worthless. He had to start all over again and he went into publishing. So he began one business after the other. So entrepreneur, librarian, and the result is somebody who has a bookish business idea with Capital Expert Service, but who also was entrepreneurial within NACD with the knowledge function. You speak four languages. I'm oh, sure yeah. that helped a bit. How did that help you navigate your career path, and how important is it today for people to be multilingual in our global economy? Well, that is so interesting. I think we can do a lot with English because it still is the dominant business language and it is the dominant internet language and everything can be translated by the bots. But I think in terms of person to person, to the extent that businesses still happen one-on-one -on -one with personal relationships and to the extent that we have a global economy, nothing is better than mastering a language. It might take you 20 years, which it took me to learn French. It might take you five weeks which it took me to learn Spanish, only because Spanish came second, not because Spanish is any less difficult. But once you have that language, you can break the ice with a person. There's nothing like speaking German with a German, Spanish with an Hispanic, French with a Frenchman. I said Frenchman, French woman too. Was sexism or harassment ever an issue for you? And if so, how did you deal with it? And what would you say to other women if it happens to them? Another great question. I think the worst sexism has been in my own view of myself because I grew up in the 50s and this is right when Simone de Beauvoir had written her book and it was before women's liberation and I had very low aspirations for myself. When I was 12 years old I poured my heart out and wrote a letter to the world which I hid inside the wall of my home and the letter said, Dear world, hello, my name is Alex Reed and I I love Monday because I love to go to school. I hope and pray someday I will marry a man who loves me. We will have children. Three is a good number. Well, that's it, world. I was 12 oh. years old. And by now, 12-year-old girls have, they're going to be astronauts. You still have that but letter? All I, yes, I do. I found <laughs> it the other day. But that's why I know it by heart. But, uh, you know, it's, and I had women of accomplishment in my family. My mother, my grandmother's all librarians. I had an aunt who got a PhD in 1905 from the University of Berlin. But my aspirations for myself were very low. They graduated, I want to marry Prince Charles. Thank goodness I didn't. <laughs> so what changed then, in you? What? what what changed in me, I think, was education. I went to Bennington College. I was going to be, I was just going to be, well, I shouldn't say just, but all my thought was I was going to, into the performing arts. I'm going to be an actress. That was something females did in my mind. But literature became a calling. I studied comparative literature. I went all the way with that, with a five-year program uh, at, at, at Princeton University, studying all these different languages in the med medieval period. But then there were no jobs. So I had to start all, all over again. And I began to study business at Loyola. At then it was called a college. Now, ever since I've been there, it's become a university, Loyola University in, in Maryland. And so what changed in me was I think learning, education, 
seeing what's out there in the world for myself and seeing how other professors and projects would respond to me, I began to gain confidence as I hadn't really growing up public school system in, in Virginia. And then I began to claim the examples of my ancestors and of my own mother and father. And during this period when you were exploring and finding yourself, did any of these people become role models for you? Oh, what a good question, role models. In terms of, I would say the women in my early work years, there were women in corporate governance who were on boards of directors and leading audit committees and leading boards of directors. And Jean Head Cisco, for example, was a, was a luminary in the world of governance. And so I saw people like Jean Head Cisco, uh, Barbara Franklin, Aretha Clark King, and others thrive as women and they became role models for me. In terms of harassment, I never really had it. So I have no war stories on that score. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> what, a, what a breath of fresh air, right? Woo. <laughs> <laughs> so what traits and skill sets are needed to be a successful chief knowledge officer? And can you share an example? I, I, well, I have to do multiple ones. First of all, one has to have an empathy with the seeker of knowledge. What does, a, if you're working for an association, what, what do members of our association want to know? How might they ask their question? What might they really need to know? So you have to really be able to put yourself in the shoes of the learner if you're going to be organizing knowledge for the learner. Another trait has to be a lack of fear of technology and a true respect for technology. One doesn't have to be an IT expert oneself, but the IT people are the ones who are going, in this day and age, with the growth of the internet, they're the ones who are going to unlock the key to success for you. If you can't work with an IT team or an IT person, you're doomed as a, as a knowledge manager. Also, I think a sense, a good old-fashioned sense of knowledge hierarchy. I know today you can tag everything by most specific nature, such as, uh, let's say, distressed bonds. But you have to know that distressed bonds are under the category bonds and that bonds are under the category of securities and that securities are under the category of capital and that capital is under the category of enterprise. Unless you understand and appreciate all that, you really don't have knowledge. So I think you need to have a hierarchical sense of knowledge. I think you need to have empathy for uh, people who are seeking knowledge, true respect for IT. And, and with those, I think it'll take you a, a long way in, in the field of knowledge management. So how do you manage social media platforms to your advantage? Okay, well, first of all, I avoid <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> I have a, a, just an obligatory Facebook account because I have a couple of cousins with whom that's the best way to communicate. But if I got caught up in the oh, personal lives of all the people I love, I would, I would never leave. And also, I'd start to become self-conscious. How, how do I look? Did, did I have a happy Christmas? Do I have pictures to prove it? I don't want to live on that, on that level. So I avoid Facebook. I also, I have a very, how will I say, I have a way of being very active on Twitter without doing a lick of work. And that is that when I read something that's interest, I simply tweet it or retweet it. I, if I think of something extremely clever with a one word, I'll, I'll put it in. But I, you know, I, I realize that my social media presence is permanent. If I ever run for public office, it's all going to be there, so I just have to be very careful. So I'm either going to spend two hours saying, what's the sentence right. I'm going to put in front of this article, or am I just going to retweet it? Mm -hmm. So there's that. And then LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. I adore LinkedIn. I'm, I joined the maximum number of groups. I've been active in, in, in some of them to a meaningful degree. I started a group called Renaissance People for people who are involved in multiple disciplines. So that's my presence. I don't think about it much, but I, I think it's... It's there. All right, back in 1988, you launched the big book that we have here on our table, uh, The Art of M&A, which is still in print today. You've had several editions of it. Now, fast forward 1998, 10 years later, you started more spin-offs and getting more in-depth about M&A topics, such as strategy, valuation, etc. And now, finally, you're going to be launching yet another series of this book coming out in just a few months. Why the massive reprints of this particular topic? I love the way you asked that question because I hadn't realized how crazy I am until now. Because why? <laughs> I mean, I've done so much in this whole field of M&A reference books. 
And I think there are a lot of reasons. First of all, it's filial piety. My father, when his business crashed to the ashes in the 60s and we had been very rich and suddenly we were poor and he needed to start all over, he started in publishing, he published a magazine, the very first one called Mergers and Acquisitions, the Journal of Corporate Venture. And even though that was only in the background when I was a medievalist and an actress and studying comparative literature, it was, it was there. And when I had to start all over, I came into working with him and for him, and I found the topic of mergers and acquisitions fascinating. So I helped him out on this first book, The Art of M&A, in 1988, I was the project manager. Then I began to edit the second edition and so forth. And ever since then, I've put out this massive amount of material on M&A. And first of all, the fact that the market liked it was very pleasing to me. I get fan mail and letters and questions from all over the world, and, and I love that, helping people. But also, it's, it's very, it's interdisciplinary. You have not only finance and law and accounting, you have human resources, you have strategy. Anything and everything involving business somehow gets dragged into M&A. So it's a fascinating topic. It's also when my life is getting a little bit, uh, say, melodramatic for one reason or another, being you know, in, in involved in, in marriage or family or parenting, you're always going to have some crises from time to time. There's nothing like studying the tax code to get your mind off of everything. <laughs> so I love it. You discussed that last year alone, over 40,000 companies changed ownership via mergers and acquisitions. So how do you advise your readers in the art of executing a successful M&A? You know what's interesting about those numbers, the, there are, talking about hierarchy, if you count every single transaction, including 10% or more interest and values at any dollar amount and all over the world, you can really come up with a million a year that are happening. Mm -hmm. But as you get more and more relevant and honest and specific, you can say, well, let's only count major, major deals and let's only count deals, for instance, uh, involving U.S. The numbers get smaller and smaller, so I don't mean to exaggerate, but even if we say 10,000 10, deals worth 10 million or more involving U.S. companies, that's still a lot, a lot of transactions. And so, in terms of success, there's a very well-known statement that 80% of all mergers fail. It's rarely backed up with what, it, what do people mean by failure. And people like Dean Robert Bruner of University of Virginia Darden School have looked deeply into this and have said, well, it, it, there are different ways of defining failure, different ways of defining success, and really the record's about half and half. Now that's not very good. In other words, you do a merger, you've got a 50% chance of success on any level, no matter how you define success or failure. That is, shows how risky the, the mergers can be. In terms of, you ask me, what is the key to success? There are a couple. First of all, you have to have a strategic reason for the acquisition. You have to kind of know your strategy ahead of time and then find the, the acquisition. Secondly, you have to make sure you don't overpay. I don't care how easy the money is, how low interest rates are, how high your stock is. If you overpay for the value, you're going to pay for it in the end. And then also you have to ha definitely have to have a good post-merger integration plan. If you just say you're going to ha it's going to be a standalone, you have to know that and claim that. But if you say you're going to integrate, think of all the things you've got to integrate. You've got to think all of that through. What percentage of mergers and acquisitions are actually successful and what can be done to reduce the failure rate? Well, again, you know, it's such, such an interesting question. I would say that in terms of the one, it, it, if you look at success rate in terms of how often do they fulfill the, the dream of the acquirer, those rates are pretty healthy because they can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You can say, this is how I define success, and you can just go after it. It's not that difficult. But if you look at, for instance, impact on, on the shareholders of the buying company, that is always a little bit negative. If you look at the impact on the shareholders of the selling company, that's always healthily positive. And then if you look at the average, it's about in the middle. So in terms of really nailing, nailing, nailing success, you have to, again, you can't, you can't overpay. You, you've got to have a strategic reason. 
and then you have to know, know how to integrate. What are some of the ways to identify a successful M&A opportunity? Well, you know, it's interesting about an opportunity. I think that you have to think ahead for what you want and strategic planning is a fascinating topic unto itself. We have a whole book on it in the series. Strategic planning used to be only a matter of management going off to the side, coming up with a plan, bringing it to the board of directors. And then the board of directors would be perhaps taken by surprise and say, well, tell me more. And then management might say, well, we found this great deal. It's a bargain. And we've been thinking about this. And this is what we want to do. And then the directors suddenly, mind you, they only work maybe 250 hours a year because they have to be independent. They have to have their own lives. They can't be dependent on the company for money. They convene six times a year. They're expected to suddenly understand this proposition. Today, and this is the work of the National Association of Corporate Directors where I spent 30 years, what happens is that the board and management are constantly talking about strategy at every single meeting and should we grow, should we not grow, what opportunities are out there. But it all has to do with where the company's headed and what the strategy is. So I would define a good opportunity as something that fits a predetermined need, a pre-identified need in the company from a strategic point of view. That's an opportunity. Can you explain to us some of the top considerations uh, of a buyer's business plan and that of a seller's? How does that all come together? Yeah, I like I like the idea of a business plan. I, I was mentioning strategy, strategy, strategy. That gets a little bit like castles in the air. We'd like to become the leader of the in the field of hydraulics globally. That's a little bit abstract in general. A business plan says we plan to allocate at least 10% of profits to R&D so that we can improve our hydraulics and we plan to give a dividend of at least you know, two cents a share to our uh, shareholders so that we can keep that. And business plans are very detailed. And I think that although they're, they're really disclosed, so we don't have a good sense of them, I think anybody who's been involved in business knows how detailed business plans can get. So I would say that in, in terms of business plans for the buyer in an M&A context, business plans for the seller has to do with all of the details they've thought of in advance. And the beauty of that is, when does it all come up? It all comes up in the acquisition agreement. And that's why I love lawyers. They will sit by their client, be it a buyer or a seller. And by the way, you can't have the same lawyer on both sides. Mm -hmm. And they will say, make sure that's in the acquisition agreement. That was part of your plan. And for the seller, what's your exit plan? What, what did your venture capitalists say they absolutely had to get? What kind of return did they need to get on their investment? Is the price going to meet that exit plan? And what about your people? Do you want to keep their jobs? If so, you've got to put that in the acquisition agreement that you shall continue to employ our people. Conversely, on the buyer's side, uh, the, the, the lawyer will say something like, well, you, you plan to get, say, that two, two, two cents a share on. Do you, are you sure you're going to be able to do that with this deal? Maybe you should lower the price if, if you don't think you're going to hit that mark. So those detailed business plans that exist prior to the merger transaction have to be respected, and they all should feed into that acquisition agreement with the help of qualified counsel. While writing about M&A for boards of directors, uh, can you share some concerns and challenges about these transactions? If you look at boards of directors and managers, you might say, who does what? Mm -hmm. Interestingly, state law is very clear on that. Only directors can can sell the entire company, only directors. Manager, they can't delegate that decision to management. They can delegate a lot of things to management, product development and so forth. They can't delegate that. So that's squarely on the board. The board is responsible for any decision to sell an entire company. OK. Therefore, when a board of directors votes to sell a company to another company, they are responsible for that sale. Now, if they do it incorrectly, you'd think, well, they could be sued. They did not fulfill their responsibility and obligation very well. But there's something called the business judgment rule that says that as long as they take the care to understand the transaction and take the time to be very careful about it and they have no conflicts of interest and nobody's pockets are getting lined from the transaction, they'll be fine. 
they don't have to have a success. Even if the stock price goes way down, if they did their, their homework, they will be, hold their heads high under the business judgment rule and they can't be sued. Well, the trouble is, shareholders will sue anyway. If they lose a lot of money on a deal, they will sue that selling board of directors. They, all of them, you know, individually, they will, sell, they will sue the advisors and so forth. And you think, well, oh, the business judgment rule will protect them. Have no fear. Sometimes, though, the, the board is a little bit lacks confidence that it really can show on the record that it showed due diligence and that it, it was, had absolutely no conflicts of interest and certainly no failure of the duty of, of care. They might settle. And I, I was just rereading that, that old book there, The Art of M&A Integration, second edition from around 2006. And looking back, OK. Time Warner shareholders successfully settled with the parent company of AOL Time Warner after their share price lost 75% of value. They settled and they got well, maybe $2.6 billion. Just pay like, OK, we'll pay you. We're sorry. So that's the big concern that directors have. Not only do they, of course, want a, a merger to succeed, but if it doesn't succeed, they have some risk of, of, of uh, liability and, and in terms of the board gets sued now. Whether it's personal liability to directors, that's very rare. But still, it's the reputational liability that they care about. What are some of the tax considerations uh, to bear in mind while structuring an M&A deal? And how is it going to change with the new administration? Good question. Tax is very important for M&A. It's part of the whole financial impact of a transaction. And there are certain fundamentals in tax that really never change or are very unlikely to change. And then there are other things that, that are variable and do change. What, what the new tax bill came out with two major changes that, that will impact M&A. One being, of course, hallelujah, a lower corporate tax rate. So the maximum tax rate used to be 35 percent. Now it's 21 percent. And it's a huge difference. And I hope I do get a chance to sing the praises of all the companies that are using that tax break wisely today. And maybe I'll get to that later. But I knew that would happen, and I'm very glad that it's happening. But another part of this tax bill that's, that's coming up is that the, it used to be that if you, if you borrowed money from a bank and you have this debt and you pay back the debt, you could deduct those interest payments from your income and, just, and you, you'd, you'd have less tax exposure and you'd pay lower taxes. It's the whole that fueled a lot of leverage deals where, with, with a lot of debt. But right now it says that you can only, uh, you can only deduct taxes that are, uh, you can't deduct, uh, make any deductions over 30% of earnings before uh, interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization for the next couple of years. And then after that, only before earnings, before interest and, and taxes, which basically means that it's kind of trying to discourage leverage and say, you can't get as many tax breaks as you used to by just borrowing a lot of money. You have to be a little more careful. I don't mind that because highly leveraged working uh, definition of that is 75%. So if you're saying 66%, that's not a huge difference. And you're basically saying, don't over leverage. So basically, debt capital is going to be a little defavorized after this new tax bill. Um, and then in terms of the wonderful lower corporate tax rate. That's just a boom, a boon all around. I noticed, though, that a lot of those wonderful companies and they're responding to it, and I'm talking about JP Morgan, Disney, Verizon, AOL, a lot of major companies, they're not suddenly saying, oh, great, I'm going to buy a lot of companies. They're saying, no, I'm going to give bonuses to employees. I'm going to, I'm going to give a college, college uh, education to employees. I'm going to invest in R&D, et cetera. I think that's the right move because we really need a solid infrastructure. What are some of the biggest risks for banking M&A? The biggest risk by far is loss of customers because I don't know a single banking customer who's ever said, oh great, my bank's going to change its logo. Oh great, my bank's going to change its technology. Oh great, my bank manager is going to get fired. In fact, oh great, my bank uh, branch is going to close. So the biggest problem is customers, loss of customers. and. The great thing is that the smart banks think about that and they do a ton of local advertising to make people feel friendly toward banks. And I'm thinking Synovus, my bank, this First Coast Bank, 
they, I have a great branch manager, Antoinette Richter, and they've made her a celebrity. They have all these pictures of her, some novice. They're having parties. They're, they're, she's become a local celebrity that she's, she was with First Coast. First Coast is still here in spirit, but it's now part of Synovas. And Antoinette is part of Synovas. So they paid respect to those branch managers and so forth. So, uh, and by the way, speaking of J.P. Morgan, I mentioned them earlier, they're actually going to open a lot of new branches and they're going to do a low income lending and more b distressed business lending. They're, oh, it's just the greatest thing. So banks, they have to worry about their reputation. They have to serve communities. Bank mergers can be so good. They've, they haven't been so good in the past, but hopefully with examples like J.P. Morgan, they're going to start looking really great because they won't lose those customers or those communities. What role do women play in leadership positions as far as the, in the M&A domain and corporations that you've been dealing with? You asked me earlier what kind of sexism I might have experienced, and I said it was my own self-perception self as a child. One of the things that as a child, I never thought science, I thought, oh, that's, yeah, that's for boys. Uh, and looking back, I really wish I'd studied science. It seems to me science is the bomb. I mean, everything's happening in science, including biology. Now, I, I would love to be able to give you a very good biological answer about men and women, and I can't. I read a lot, but I, I've read that women are better at dealing with chaos and men are better at dealing with ordered systems. I don't even know if it's true because I haven't really studied biology beyond you know, a few high school courses. But I'm intrigued by that theory, and it seems to me that mergers can be naturally quite chaotic, quite complex, quite dynamic. And so I think that although both men and women are very valuable in dealing with M&A, I think women are a little more happy, satisfied, challenged, uh, coming to life in a, in a merger context. I've never known an unhappy merger leader, merger advisor who is a female. Whereas men, I can't, I can't see how they'll be very happy with the mess that mergers are, even though they add a lot of value. So I've seen that. I've seen a lot of interesting women in, in uh, you know, Sue Ryder of World Fuels doing their integration program, uh, Lorraine Sostowski with being a, a great tax guru in, in, in M&A. Uh, Diane Harrison, an, an integration expert way back in the 80s. I've seen a lot of women, and they they all seem very fulfilled in their work. So they and when they they never kind of retire and go and do something else. Whereas a lot of men in M&A, uh, including all the big investment bankers from the 80s, they all left at early ages and went and, and formed charities, which is great. I'm glad for them, but they did not they did not tr feel spiritually fulfilled with M&A. Women can find spiritual fulfillment because we find ways to. Help. <laughs> and is it still more a male-dominated area? What, what is? Do you know the percentages? Oh. Did you say women are were, were made were born to be involved <laughs> in this chaotic uh, <laughs> job? Yeah, they, they were born to be there, and and it is still male-dominated. I think partly because it's funny. It there's a lot of money in M and A, a lot, and it. I think that men, for 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 men. There, there's more importance attached to, to income, could be because of their ancient provider role, although that's uh, obviously changing. Uh, it could be that it has to do with some, some status, I'm not sure. But I think I, I, can, I can also see why men would be attracted to the field, because it does pay well if investment banking pays very well, for example. But I think that in terms of spiritual satisfaction, I'm, I'm not sure. Now, I, I have no basis in saying this. I'm practically making it up. But hey, <laughs> imagination is a great yeah. thing. <laughs> the actress in you is coming out. <laughs> the playwright. <laughs> All right. So, what are some of the top comp competencies and skills required for one to succeed in the M&A profession, which you touched on mm -hmm. a little bit earlier? Competencies and skills in M&A. Well, I think certainly you you just as in knowledge management, you can't hate or fear a IT. In M&A, you can't hate or fear math. You have to love the numbers. Even if you don't do advanced math, you at least need to know arithmetic. <laughs> and you have to, to respect that because it, it, that's a very, very important measurement of, of merger value. What, what is happening to share price? What is happening to, to the balance sheet? What's happening to the income statement? So uh, a, a, a lack of fear and a, and a friendliness toward numbers, a 
I would also say, I would say a good sense of your own industry and where it's headed, because whether you're going to exit it or stay in it, you had, need to know its dynamics, and, and that would help. Uh, talking about just basic skills for m and I think people skills are very important. I think that at some point, the people who are making a decision to sell are human beings, and they need to be treated with respect, um, whether they're going to buy or sell. So there's that. Talk to us about some of the programs you'll be launching and have launched with Capital Expert Services, your global consultancy group. It's been very interesting. We started it as a Delaware LLC in February of 2016 with three partners. We're all three equal owners. And the original concept, which is still near and dear to my heart, was to gather all the deep, deep, deep experts I've come to know over my 40 years in, in business and in governance all over the world to gather them together as a talent registry for the sole purpose of becoming expert witnesses in litigation involving complex, thorny business issues. So I was dreaming that people like Dennis Beresford, who used to chair the Financial Accounting Standards Board and who knows all about option valuation and, and, and reporting option values would be testifying in a major, major case that involves uh, options mm -hmm. and their accounting therewith. <laughs> but instead, we have had a lot of interest from law firms and we have done searches for experts, mm -hmm. but it's never so far, it hasn't been about governance, it hasn't been about accounting, it hasn't been about finance, it hasn't been about mergers. And why do you think that is? Well, it's because people fight over the darndest things so in business. So we've done searches in green energy. We've done searches in, in uh, mortgage fraud. We've done searches in automobile safety. We've done searches in, in uh, Colorado pipelines. So what happens is that if lawyers need expert witnesses, they need somebody who's extremely specialized. And sometimes they say, oh, nobody we don't want a professor, we don't want a senior executive, we want a middle management who, manager who was there working on site when something happened. So they're very, very specific. So, and we've gone where that need is and we have fulfilled some, some good assignments there. Still, I'm wondering, what am I gonna do with all these brainiacs that I've recruited and who have said, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to, to testify. So we started other ideas. We started a webinar series. We did one on artificial intelligence recently. We started an innovation council where we're thinking about what are the great social problems and how can our skills solve them. Maybe we can get a grant. So financial literacy, for example, would be a good, good cause. So we're, we're, we're kind of finding our bearings of we have this talent pool. We haven't engaged it yet. So how are we going to do that? And meanwhile, how are we going to keep you know, paying the bills? So it's been very interesting. How have you been helping organizations deal with cybersecurity, hacking, and privacy issues? That's interesting. I have to put on my NACD hat now, <laughs> National Association of Corporate Directors. I'm still involved with them. My title is Chief Knowledge Officer Emeritus, and I do have a contract to serve as an, in an advisory capacity, so I'm very well aware of everything NACD continues to do. And NACD has been on this since really the year 2000, they started, uh, we, I was, I was a we then, we did uh, studies of information security, that's what it was called then, information security, and there was a White House summit on that in 2001, and we were part of that. Tom Horton, uh, the late great from IBM, was on our board. But since then, we've been holding global summits, and we have people come from all over the world, from director organizations all over the world, and to talk about what they're doing to fight cybercrime. And that's the big takeaway from that that I've seen, is that in no other field can you see such great private, public uh, uh, mutual cooperation. The police, the FBI, the military, uh, company CEOs, company CIOs, all working together, exchanging ideas, exchanging information, it's the closest to business heaven you'll ever see, is that what's happening in cybersecurity, because everybody's just extremely frightened of what's going to happen as, uh, as cybersecurity becomes more and more of a threat. Are there any preventative measures that companies can take or individuals that you 
have come across in your dealings with? Yeah, well, issues? what having attended some of these cyber summits and, and, and knowing some of the information packages that we try to put together at, at, a, at uh, NACD to, to solve this problem, or you can't solve it, but to, to be safer in this, in this cyber world, I would say that one of them is employee training because a lot of, a lot of the problems that happen is that a naive employees will click on a link that comes in, they, they don't understand about fraud, so you have to absolutely train your employees to be the first line of defense against any kind of hacking. Also, the IT people have to just constantly get new and new, and Russell Sarter would love this, education, education, yeah. training on what are the latest ruses that the villains use and how can we use our technology to, to, to thwart them, mm -hmm. patches and the like. And then, again, that, that idea of the exchange of information, public-private. So those are some of, the, some of the solutions. Is there one corporate issue or problem that seems to stand out, keep happening, or, or that you've been able to successfully deal with or confront? It has to be litigation. People suing people. People, shareholders suing companies, pretty much. At NACD, from the very beginning, and I was around really in the late 70s when it was starting, I got involved in the early 80s, mid 80s, when it was starting to launch, the whole purpose of the National Association of Corporate Directors was to prepare directors to really fight two battles. One would be over-regulation from the federal government that was what we predicted was coming. We didn't know how long it would take. It took all the way till 2002 with Sarbanes-Oxley, but also shareholder litigation. How can we train directors to act the right way, do the right things, say the right things, so they won't be over-regulated and so they won't be sued? So I was on the defense side for, for 40 years. I had no sympathy or empathy for those litigants, if you will, or even for regulators. Now that I'm an entrepreneur, I, I, I'm starting to see both sides, and I see that, that, that litigation, because we can't, at, at Capital Expert Services, we can't say we will only provide experts to the, to the defense side. We will not provide experts to, to the plaintiff side. We've got to really play both sides. But then we, we say, is, is it a worthy cause? Is, is there justice in this, or is this just a nuisance lawsuit? So we- So you pick and choose. We pick and choose. Mm -hmm. And so, but I would say litigation is the most important, and that's why I keep praising attorneys. They can help you modulate your speech so that you are less vulnerable to litigation. Even now as I speak, I'm thinking, am I going to be vulnerable to litigation? So I'm going to modulate my speech. And it can be done without suppressing spontaneity. <laughs> so how has technology changed M&A transactions? Oh boy, that is such a good question. And I would say that it's, in my lifetime, and it's kind of ideal that I was born in 1950 and that I hand typed my own PhD dissertation, right? Actually, I paid someone to type it because my <laughs> typing wasn't that good <laughs> for various reasons. But I, it, it's, it's changed enormously. It used to be that with due diligence, you'd have to collect all kinds of documents and you'd have a document room and there would be file cabinets with labels and such. And now, of course, there's the virtual, the virtual uh, data room and everything is, is in the cloud. So in terms of discovery and looking into all the, the records of the target company, it's, it's all done on a computer. Also, valuation. It used to be, there were a couple of valuation models and they were pretty straightforward for a, a discounted cash flow and so forth. Now there can be very sensitive models you can add and you could subtract and give all kinds of criteria so you could literally analyze a, putting two companies together from many, many points of view through, through that. And then there's also the advent of algorithmic trading where traders just, they set, they set a formula in advance of what they'll buy and what they'll sell and what they'll hold. And that, that ha has become part of M&A because it affects share price and you have to understand how, what's happening there. So technology is, I mean, I could go on and on, but I think there's just a few small examples of how technology has changed M&A from during my lifetime. How are you gearing up for the new tax laws, and do you think they'll have a positive impact on the financial well-being of corporate America, which we know you do, <laughs> and as well as Main Street? Well, I do think it's going to be really great, and, but it really all depended on, on it, it, it depended on values. You know, if you have some, some free money, so to speak, 
There's so many ways you can spend it. You can go out and go to a saloon and never leave, right? Or you can go and build a park for children. And I'm pleased to say that corporate America is building that park for children. They are responding exactly as, as many had hoped that they would, given the fact that, that they are going to get a very significant uh, lower amount of taxes that they'll have to pay on their income. Well, thank goodness they still have an income. Obviously, c companies with a loss don't care. Yeah. But they do have an income. They will have an income. And they're going to put that money back into R&D, into employee salaries, into employee benefits, into uh, 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 build new branches for, for banks, uh, hopefully new plants for manufacturing. So I think it's what it's going to do is it's going to start to change those economic fundamentals that are so important to business valuation. I like the high stock market valuations right now because I am an investor. I have all our, my husband and I, all our wealth is in that stock market. And that makes me happy. And I'm very much a, a how will I say, an optimist. But I'm also a fundamentalist. And, and I think that unless you've got very, very solid balance sheets and a, a happy and well-trained and sustainable workforce and a good sense of strategy, paying your board enough, paying board advisors enough, you put the money where it matters, employees, I think board advisors, et cetera, unless you have all those fundamentals straight, the value is going to just evaporate. Mm -hmm. But if you have strong fundamentals, I don't care if the market goes crazy for uh, a year or two, which it did in 2007, 2008, 2000, having nothing to do with fundamentals and drops half your value. I don't care, that doesn't worry me, because it always comes back. What worries me is if there's just no real sustainable base for the value and it just erodes over time. That, that, that's not good. So I think the money, the great thing is not that the money's there, but it's gonna be put to good use on fundamentals. What are your thoughts on the rollback of the net neutrality uh, rules? I think it's bad. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm very much a small government is best. I'm, I'm anti-regulation. I don't like the big state, et cetera. I love freedom, freedom, freedom. But there's one kind of regulation I love, and that's antitrust. Mm -hmm. Antitrust. You don't want the big companies to get bigger and bigger and more dominant. And you, you, you think it's ironic I'm saying that since I'm all about M&A. And how did, how did these oligopolies come to exist without M&A? Well, that's what created them. We've got every single industry has three at the top. Like a, even, even accounting does at this mm -hmm. point, just three. And, you know, energy, uh, automotive, just three. It gets a little scary, and then the little guys can't compete. Well, with communi can you imagine with communications only having Microsoft and Google rule the world? I mean, they're powerful enough. Mm -hmm. So from the little I know, and I'm not an expert, I, I think that rolling back those, those rules, those net neutrality rules, uh, is, is, is a mistake. And, and, but it'll be corrected in time. If it, it, you know, 22 attorney generals from states are now suing. See, litigation can be a solution. I mean, they might prevail. So we need to preserve the freedom of the internet. We need to give a, a, we need to give some really extra advantages to the, to the smaller, weaker players so that we don't have too much concentration at the top of the, of the information chain. What do you think will be some of the biggest game changers in 2018 and beyond from a business and a governance perspective? Uh, I think that environmental sustainability is going to continue to be extremely important. There's nothing we can do about it. It's going, well, there's a lot we can do about it, but I'm saying no matter what we do, no matter how much we invest in alternative energy, no matter how much we invest in teaching people how to live sustainable lives and to recycle, et cetera, Mother Nature is going to continue to be very angry at us for a number of years because of all those carefree years when we were, we were reaping the benefits of the planet without giving back. And I think the best statement of that has to be the June 2015 papal encyclical by Pope Francis Laudate Si, in which he talks about how we've, it's great that we are in charge of nature, but we have to be in charge in a, in a gentle, loving, caring way. And it's actually a very, 
it's a very gentle book in which he says you have to empathize with the animals, you have to empathize with the rivers. And he's trying to change, Pope Francis is trying to change the consciousness. I think that businesses are extremely affected by what's happening in the environment. Interestingly, shareholders are now really taking up this cause as never before. And BlackRock, which is the world's largest investor in stock, bar none, has said it's going to make this a top agenda issue for it. When it invests in companies, unless they're environmentally sustainable, it's going to pull its money. So I think there's going to be more and more incentives to be environmentally sustainable. And I say that despite the fact that the deregulatory emphasis of the Trump administration has been focused on undoing environmental regulations. But my prayer and my hope is that the private sector will voluntarily, just as it did after the, mm -hmm. when, when Trump said he wasn't going to join the Paris Treaty and all the corporate sector came up and said, we will, we will voluntarily do this. I know it sounds idealistic, but I think it's going to happen. I think corporations, look at, what, look at what's happening with the response to the tax break that they now have. They're going to do the same thing with environment. Okay, no more regulations, I'm still going to comply. I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to go beyond compliance. Unless we do that, we're all doomed. <laughs> I mean, the whole world will, <laughs> you know, humanity will be wiped out in 10 years unless we really do the right thing, so we're going to. Alexandra, it's been fascinating talking <laughs> with you today. Thanks for stopping by. <laughs> Thank you. And that's it for this edition of Sarder TV. We hope you enjoyed and learned something new today. Until next time, I'm Tracy Fitzpatrick. Thanks for watching.